I can go on and on about feminism and the ridiculousness of females being seduced by a transparent, self-serving ideal, dreaming under the protective umbrella of the masculine institutions, of being equal to men, twisting the numbers, manipulating the data, selecting the statistics to interpret in any which way suits them the best. But I will not do this uh, with this video. It's easy to influence a mind by telling it what it most wishes were true. But for now, I choose to focus on another byproduct of the same ideals, the same principles, the same logic that made feminism possible and still maintains it as a viable political force. Just as Judaism produced Christianity and uh, Islam, then leading to Marxism and secular humanism, so too is this byproduct a part of the same chain of events, the same mimetic family which now dominates the better part of the world. It is to be expected that in a world of dwindling resources and exploding populations, and where no accessible frontiers remain, and no unclaimed territories are available, that certain beliefs would take hold and spread, if for no other reason than for the purpose of population control. This byproduct I allude to is none other than the emergent and now becoming YouTube popular men's rights movement. Feminism and men's rights movements are united in their hatred of life and in their common romantic idealism that erases all the bad parts of natural selection, retaining only the parts that feel good, all the parts that fit into their postmodern social dynamics. They both denounce the past as irrelevant or impotent though their own emergence is a manifestation of this very past. They both use emotional arguments, mostly the typical Judeo-Christian duo of guilt and shame to support ideas no rational mind would consider valid. Along with the first two emotions, love and hate are ushered in as companion emotives pulling at our heartstrings and speaking to the inner child or the inner female in us all. They both propose a worldview based on the dichotomy of good and evil, casting uh, themselves, coincidentally, always in the role of the wronged, the innocent, the good paladin, the eternal victim of circumstances. They both agree on the equality of all, on a genetic level, but disagree on whom has the higher moral ground and the mimetic advantage. They both agree that discrimination, the basis of consciousness, is a bad thing because it leads to someone getting hurt. And pain is not to be accepted as a necessary part of existing. Nature is made into a uh, benevolent mother, beautiful, unblemished, fair and kind, suffering under the stresses of unruly children. They both agree that all must be free, whatever free means, just as long as they behave in the appropriate way, in the socially acceptable way, in the moral way. In other words, all are free, but Exercising this freedom in a manner inappropriate or hurtful is considered evil. See the Christian dogma on this. Man is free to accept Jesus. If he does not, because he is free not to do so, he faces hell. The choice is his. Eternal slavery or eternal pain. How brilliant. Pascal's wager. The idea that 
man is born inherently good underlies both the feminist and MRA movements. In their mind, freedom was supposed to lead to a utopia, like Marxism proposed. And if it did not, then the blame is to be placed on some evildoer who did not follow the rules, rules which were denied on principle. Both rejected materialistic explanations as being inapplicable, or they cherry-pick nature to lead to a desirable worldview. All roads must lead to Jerusalem. In every way but one, is this political movement denying it is a political movement, the same with feminism. The one difference being that instead of female, they hold male, this all-encompassing identifier as being the wronged party. Well, let's be honest. The MRAs, at least, show some honesty in analyzing certain aspects of sexuality and sexual roles, something feminists cannot even consider doing. But they do so with a half-hearted, skirting around certain parts way. A way which helps them avoid the nasty parts while aiding them in getting to the uh, desirable juicy filling. Finally, both feminism and the MRA are rooted in a nature-hating, world-denouncing attitude typical of most modern ideologies and spiritual dogmas in our time seducing those who feel the most vulnerable to forces they cannot understand nor control, but uh, more so forces they cannot accept. If they seek a flock amongst the downtrodden, the wrong, the persecuted, the suffering, the desperate, then they certainly have billions upon billions to choose from. The emergence of these counter-feminism groups calling themselves uh, men's rights movements is an interesting social development. Essentially they are a reaction to their own disposability, made all the more clear once females were given back their sexual power, while male sexual power was still controlled and limited. Most men had supported feminism, it seemed like a natural next step to their previous romantic idealism. Many men still do, taking on the beta male sexual strategy. What they did not figure on was the repercussions, the collateral effects of all this feel-good pseudo-liberation. They had been convinced that human artifices were the, were the world itself. Not that they were masking the world, protecting all that uh, participated within them from nature, but that these artifices were actually the world itself. This is called institutionalization. A world, a nature that does not give a shit about any human artificial correction is a world to be feared, no doubt. Now these pathetic specimens cannot bring themselves to the realization that they figured wrong, that they had been intoxicated by a fantasy, that they had been numbed by a delusion. To protect themselves from this self-realization, because it exposes them to the uncomfortable possibility that they might be weak or not very bright, or worse, that if it were not for this dreaded paternalism, which they now hate, they would probably not be here to bitch about how unfair it all is. Male disposability, as it is called, is nothing new. All we have to do is watch a documentary on any mammalian species to see it in practice. Men did not invent male disposability, nor did females invent it. They simply manipulated it 
just as they manipulated any natural phenomenon. Our female genetic filtering systems that exclude certain males from reproduction so as to exclude the bad genes they carry? Yes. But they have no clue about it. They just feel an attraction in this way or in that way. Not realizing what it is. Just as an animal simply feels an urge to fornicate without without it ever passing his mind that this fornication results in in offspring. Our females now are mimetic filters doing the same job blindly, loyally, intuitively, instinctively, excluding bad social types? Yes. Yet it is this very male dis disposability that forces men to rise to the top or sink to the bottom. Those bitching about it are, of course, those who fear they can only sink to the bottom, or those who have already done so, now wanting to pull all others down with them in an act of vengeance. Male disposability ensures the genetic health of a species. Its irrelevance in human systems was meant to facilitate the integration of as many males as possible into the system. But this also had as a side effect the decline of genetic health for the entire group. When female se sexual cho choice was uh, restricted and controlled, it made it possible for all males to become involved and invested in the group. But it also resulted in a decrease in mental and physical health. This is a fact. Male competitiveness had consequences, collateral damage, as all wars have, a fact now manipulated by those with the desire and the means to do so. When all men could reproduce were given the right to do so, this propagated sickness and mutations that would have been naturally filtered out with predation. As a consequence, we have increasing feeble emasculated dumb males whom are now easily manipulated using emotional tricks and infantile calls to their shallow and immediate self-interest. No wonder women have lost all respect for the average man. What weakling would admit that he is not worthy of being replicated? And what idiot would support any proposition which excluded him from the group or the genetic pool? In a pseudo-democratic system, the amassing numbers of males that should have been uh, disposed of already makes movements like the MRA popular. And what do they cry about? Yes, male disposability, sometimes delivered via the mouth of a lesbian female. These male social and political movements have now adopted feminist tactics and their basic premise is anti-nature. In short, nihilism. I've gone into nihilism in, in some other of my videos. They adopted feminist tactics because these tactics have proven to be effective within the current environment. They do not delve deeper to see what they uh, were, why they were effective. They only see the outcome and there they wish to stay. On the surfaces. The element of self-hatred is prevalent and it expresses itself in this case in an outward thrust towards the source which exposes the mind to its own quality. In this case a female with her role as filtering system, genetic and mimetic filtering system, reflects back the judgment, re reflects back this judgment, mirroring a natural or a mimetic ideal. They hate what they see, but instead of adapting, they want to shatter the glass. As with feminism, this particular reactionary group adopts the identity of a victim. The other is the evil, and they are but uh, this ambiguous amalgamation of individuals possessing a single shared common characteristic. They are the eternal victims, innocent and pitiful. 
shame is utilized in, in a direct way. Although they cannot let go of their shared identity, their equalizing persona, because this would result in internal fragmentation, they imply shame and project guilt upon the other, who has presumably wronged them. The aggression is passive and can easily be denied. It is feminine to the core. It retains the power of shame and guilt while not actually stating it. It is typical for a weak position to fall back on emotional arguments to support itself and to discredit the opposition. Females do this all the time and feminism uh, uses emotional arguments in all areas from, from parody and pay to rape accusations. Shame and guilt are part of their panoply. Now the MRAs are also using it. In their case it's a form of a preemptive, preemptive defensive strike. Like a liar would be the first to accuse another of lying, taking some pressure off of uh, himself, or taking that weapon out of the hands of anyone who uh, saw what he was and dared to accuse him of it. So too do these uh, emasculated males using shame and guilt as an accusatory weapon now are the first to accuse others of it. They are the first to fling it, trying to hide the fact that their entire premise is based on shaming and guilt. How very Jewish of them. Their desire to correct female behavior utilizes shame as a method. Their threat of turning their backs, quote unquote, is supposed to accentuate their sense of moral indignation. Children pouting to get their way. But uh, what are they trying to correct? Female nature, as it has evolved through thousands upon thousands of years, is that what they're trying to correct? Is that where, what they're trying to shame back to its senses? Once more, they presume that women have a clue that all this is part of a premeditated effort on their part. Might as well blame a tiger for being a cat. Women. I repeat, have always been, and always will be, a means to an end. In modern times, this end is not what it used to be, this is true. And the means have become more subtle, more sophisticated. Children is what we are dealing with here. Stunted minds, to put it bluntly. Unable to mature in a system that has protected them from themselves, and one which has made any description of the natural world, no matter how simplistic it might be, seem like it is some profound insight. When one speaks of the nature of women and men in their primordial natural setting with no human contrivances, to these minds it is as if one is discussing alien worlds. But this too is an outcome of a more sophisticated means which I spoke of before. They've just awoken to the reality of the world, and they do not like it. The small taste they have uh, been forced to tolerate has left a bitterness in their mouth. They go crying to their father, the system, wanting him to protect them from this big, bad world. Some MRAs speak of refocusing of their energies towards self-improvement, as they put it. That's funny. By self-improvement, I assume they mean going up a level in the uh, computer world they are currently immersed in. Others talk of playing, of turning feminine tactics against females, essentially admitting that they are themselves emasculating, emasculated, effete, men children, who would rather play and do something constructive. They essentially admit that they are female. In a world of whores, these men children dream of being men whores. They aspire to be nothing more than that. What is play, after all, but a simulation of something else? One plays at being a warrior, or at being a mother, or at being a hunter. In nature, this play is meant to 
prepare an immature mind for the coming demands upon it. But in the case, in this case, play is made into a goal, the end itself, play for the sake of playing, a continuing distraction, a form of masturbation. Just like masturbation, the sexual act is simulated, but the outcome is unproductive, an act of release, which is exactly what playing does. It releases energies. With masturbation, one releases a seed, expends libidinal energies, but towards fruitless outcomes, sterile activity. There is no preparatory motive, as with play fighting or play acting or playing at being a parent or playing in general, since the game is the goal itself, a sterile activity performed by narcissistic juveniles wanting to remain teenagers forever. This avoids the crucial aspect of activity, the costs. Irresponsible is what a female or a child is. A, I quote from one of Jack Nicholson's movie lines in regards to women. I think of a man, he says, then I take away reason and accountability." Unquote. And what do these men children calling themselves MRAs propose but an escape from accountability and reason? To remain a child is to remain unaccountable for your own actions. It is to play with no costs, but with the heavy price of also having no benefits. A mimetic sterilization. It's easy to understand why such views would become popular. I would be surprised if they were not. In a world of sheltering and where previous practices have introduced into the genetic pool unwanted feeble, feeble uh, mutations, it is only normal to assume that the numbers of feeble-minded weaklings would be on the rise, turning them into a political force to be reckoned with. The meek shall inherit the earth, and reality is now decided by po popular vote. Welcome to the desert of the real. Many of these uh, so-called liberals, leftists, libertarians, whatever you, whatever label they, they put themselves, they place upon themselves, Marxists, socialists, progressives. These emasculated males, these beta males, often ask as a way of discrediting any position that exposes their own weakness. Why has paternalism failed then? This is their uh, rhetorical or not so rhetorical question. But Paternalism has not failed, it has merely morphed. Paternalism does not mean that there is some worldwide club of males getting together to decide how to divide the, uh, the world. This is what the uh, simplest feminist thinks. Paternalism is a constant male-on-male -male competition where versions of different cultures applying variations of paternalistic dominance attempt to outdo each other. Women are the means, but also the reward, because women are conduits towards the future. The destiny of a people passes through the wombs of their women. This male-on-male -male competitiveness is what produces technologies. Weaponry is an example of a technology, or of technologies developed to outperform other male-dominated tribes. In an effort to outperform one another, males become innovative creative, brutal, strong, aware. Marriage is another such technology, one meant to integrate as many males within a group as possible. What we are dealing with with this feminism is an assault on a particular masculine type, a particular tribe of men. What better way to weak, weaken an opposition to do away with a threat than by taking away the only means it has for replenishing its numbers. This is a mimetic, if you will, technology that does not require weaponry, per se, since it infects the mind, the minds of women 
and men and mostly children. This infection was introduced into Western culture at a particular time and like any other virus it has mutated over the centuries reaching its current apex of liberalism promoting such ideals as equality and uh, love and justice all undefined but nice sounding to the simplistic mind seductive to the average dolt who just wants a blankie to hide under what this illness does is it enters into a bloodline via its weakest points its effete males its children its females infecting from the bottom up were not the slaves of rome the first to give themselves over to the christian doctrine were not the workers the first to give themselves over to communism did not Judaism spread amongst many tribes, amongst the lowest strata, social strata of uh, many tribes across the Middle East? Were not the ugliest, fattest, the lesbians, the first to give themselves over to feminism? And are not the most effete, emasculated, the childlike, the first to give themselves over to uh, these feel-good men's rights movements but the MRA despite its foundations and its essence is a useful tool it is useful because it injects into the social conversation ideas which need to be aired exposing some few women to a cleansing breeze exposing some few men to alternatives the MRAs are now our means to an end.